So finally, we are to our patron of the unit, and this is Mary of uh, Hungary. And she's also known as Mary of Austria. She was the daughter of Queen Joanna and King Philip I of Castile. Uh, Mary uh, married King Louis uh, II of Hungary and Bohemia in 1515. And their marriage was happy, but short and childless. So upon her husband's death, uh, following the Battle of Mohawks in 1526, Queen Mary governed Hungary as regent in the name of the new king, her brother, Ferdinand I. Um, following the death of their Aunt Margaret in 1530, Mary was asked by her eldest brother, Charles V, who we have heard of in this unit, and he was the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, he said to assume the governance of the Netherlands and guardianship over their nieces, Dorothea and Christina of Denmark. And as governor of the Netherlands, Mary faced riots and difficult relationships with the emperor. Uh, throughout her uh, reign, she continuously attempted to ensure peace between the emperor, her brother, and the king of France, but she never uh, enjoyed governing and asked permission to actually resign several times. Uh, by the end of her life, she actually was given permission to resign, and she um, passed away shortly after. So we're going to get into her as a patron, but... Um, So Mary as a patron, um, she was an advocate of the arts and this actually includes music, but we're not, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to talk about, um, these two paintings that she had. And this is the deposition of Christ and Arnolfini portrait. And I found this to be really fascinating that she has, uh, specifically this portrait due to the fact of how many times I have seen it and never knew that Mary uh, of Hungary patroned this and how that is actually left out of the history of the painting. Um, it would be very interesting to see uh, the books that I had as a child and see if Mary of Hungary was mentioned in them. But just these two um, paintings are obviously iconic and notable. Alrighty, so before we get into the actual core of what the unit is specifically about, um, we need to take a little detour and talk about the labors of Hercules. Um, there's been many different ways of telling the story of the labors of Hercules, but basically in this uh, unit, we're going to be talking about um, how Hercules was tricked by the goddess Hera into murdering his wife and family. And after consulting with the Oracle Delphi, which is actually somebody that was in King Eurythys' court who gave um, oracles and consultants, Hercules um, approached the king and and he was the one who assigned him to the 12 labors in order to atone for his sins. Um, and I would either like you to go and watch the labors of Hercules video and um, kind of navigate through that first before you go on with the lesson. But if you would like to go watch it after, that's okay too. But some of the things might confuse you within the next couple slides. But um, things to think about. What could be the reason for depicting mythology in the 16th century? Um, could this be for power, prestige? Um, does it have anything to do with humanism? Um, and going back to a better time, um, we also have to note that during this time, the Protestant Reformation was still something that was very present and um, took dominance over life, culture, and art. So keep these things with you as we move on in this lesson. 
So Mary and the labors of Hercules. And when I say this, I'm not referring to Mary and the story of Hercules. But what I'm actually referring to is the tapestries that she um, acquired in her life. So the purchase of the labors of Hercules um, was first documented in 1535. And at that time, she would have received 12 tapestries. Um and this was, you know, the series or the story of Hercules. And that's what we can um, assume. And they were all made with wool and silk. And when I say assume, it's because, um, unfortunately, only six remain today. And therefore, we only have pictures and subject matters of those six. So in um we know that in 1751 all 12 were still together. But at that time um four pieces were judged to be in really poor condition and so those were uh discarded. And um the six pieces that remain are currently preserved in the Spanish Royal Collections. And as you might have just done the math Two of them are just unknown. We don't know where those are because they're not with the six and they weren't documented as being discarded. So um, it would have been very interesting to see all 12 tapestries, um, pictures of them together, because obviously we would have had a better understanding of maybe why Mary um, would have wanted these labors of Hercules tapestries in the first place. All right, so here we are seeing just one of the six tapestries that remain. And honestly, it is remarkable that this one is one of the tapestries that survived. And I say that because it is such a beautiful piece. And if you've watched the videos... Um, of the labors of Hercules, you know that this is the last and final labor that Hercules needed to do in order to fully atone for his sins. Um, and the iconography in this specific tapestry is a limitless. You can look at anywhere on this tapestry and find something of importance or um, something that represents another thing. And um, I'm just going to point out quickly the border. Um, so this image is surrounded and encapsulated by fruits and flowers. And um, that can definitely represent uh, Hercules' fruitful journey and his um, success. And also, another thing that we can see is what looks to be torches on the top. And what does a torch represent? And um, I would I would like to think a torch represents enlightenment. And we know that from the story, uh, Hercules is enlightened at the end of it. He has fully atoned for um, murdering his family. And this must have been such a victorious scene and depiction. And now we have to think about why would Mary of Hungary want this tapestry? What did it represent for her and her court and her people? Um, we can take that into um, the next slide as well. So in this slide, we are looking at a side by side of Charles V, Mary's brother, who we've been talking about in this unit. And we are also seeing the tapestry we were previously just looking at. Um, and I did this in order for you to see the similarities between the two men. So if you look at um, Hercules' face, you can see the jawline and some of the features almost resembling Charles V. Um, so thinking about Mary and her being the one to um, patron these tapestries, what could her motivations be for wanting Hercules to resemble 
her own brother. Um, at first thought, we could think that Mary patroned these tapestries in order to resemble her own power and her own battles that she's had to go through in her life. But we can also um, take into consideration that her brother was ruling and um, trying to be a formidable emperor at the same time. And I'm really going to leave you um, with this this side by side so you can kind of make your own um, inquiries about whether you think Mary patroned these tapestries for herself or for her brother and what that means. Um, I hope that you all have enjoyed this presentation and um, I really would not be bothered if you reached out if anything was confusing or you have any questions. Um, please just let me know and I hope you have a good rest of your semester.